all cities need villages. They need villages where people can come, where they can change their identities, where nobody knows them, where they can reinvent themselves, where they can meet people and feel at home. Around the turn of the last century, the 1900s, the University of Minnesota had become a formidable institution. It was already 50 years old, it had a large campus, but it needed an equally impressive front entrance, the Memorial Gate. It was the front door of the university, but it quickly became the front door to Dinkytown, the university's downtown shopping and residence area. There were the booksellers and publishing companies, and the drugstore, eventually a branch of Dayton's department store. Before long, there were businesses to serve all the needs of the university's students and faculty. There's obviously been incredible changes over the past 110 plus years, but some things remain unchanged. The Memorial Gate is still there, but it's no longer the main entrance to the university. Dinkytown is still a vital commercial and cultural center with its own distinctive sense of place. However, recent changes have become a threat to Dinkytown's distinctive character and legacy. These are not minor changes, they are huge changes. For example, this is where University High used to be until a couple of years ago. On this corner, House of Hanson, the Book House, and the Podium were displaced by this complex. In every direction, historic Dinkytown is being replaced by large-scale development. But there's still a lot of history here, and it's not too late to stem the tide. It was a place that people wanted to go to. Um, it attracted interesting, creative, smart people. Um, it was the epicenter of countercultural um, protests and ideas uh, during the 1960s. It was, you know, not just its proximity to the University of Minnesota, I think, but also um, a place that historically um, people wanted to hang out in. What really shapes the legacy of Dinkytown is the impressive list of people who hung out here over the years and the impact that they had not only in Minnesota, but the nation and the world. In the 1940s and 50s, writers like Robert Penn Warren, Alan Tate, and the poet John Berryman taught at the university and established its English department as one of the finest in the country. The novelist Frederick Manford lived in Dinkytown for several years. Hubert Humphrey also lived in Dinkytown when he attended the university. The intellectual atmosphere of Dinkytown no doubt informed his visions of social justice that enabled him as a 35-year-old mayor of Minneapolis to establish strong anti-discrimination practices. Three years later, at the 1948 Democratic National Convention, he became a national celebrity and a leader in the civil rights movement. The time has arrived in America for the Democratic Party to get out of the shadows of states' rights and to walk forthrightly into the bright sunshine of human rights. By the mid to late 50s, the Beat Movement had taken up residence in Dinkytown. John Kerner, a former U of M student who had gone off to the West Coast for a short while, was drawn back to Dinkytown. There was the 10 o'clock scholar over in Dinkytown, and it was our example of what was happening in other places. And uh, so I fit right in there right away. You know, it wasn't only musicians, there were poets and painters and various kinds of intellectuals. And we didn't need no West Coast or East Coast to tell us what to do. We had our own notion of it all. In the early summer of 1959, a young man from the Iron Range named Bob Zimmerman came to Dinkytown. And what followed is perhaps the most famous period in Dinkytown history. In his autobiography, Chronicles, Bob Dylan recalls his time in Dinkytown. One of the first things he did was trade in his electric guitar for an acoustic, learn a few songs at a Dinkytown record store, and, with my newly learned repertoire, I then went further up the street and dropped into the 10 o'clock Scholar, a beat coffee house. I was looking for players with kindred pursuits. The first guy I met in Minneapolis, like me, was sitting around in there. It was John Kerner, and he also had an acoustic guitar with him. And Bobby Zimmerman shows up, and he's coming into a scene that's already formed. It's already there. 
um, you know, with Kerner Rain Glover and Paul Nelson and Dave Whitaker and many, many other people. And these are people dropped down into Dinky Town and they are discovering that there are worlds of music that they never suspected. And all they want to do is swim through uh, those, those oceans of music. And those oceans of music took them a long way. In late 1959, Paul Nelson and John Pancake began publishing the Little Sandy Review in Dinky Town, a very candid folk music review that drew a national following and rivaled Sing Out magazine for the next five years. Through 1959 and 60, Bobby Zimmerman was living in a room on the second floor of Gray's Drug. One of these back windows was his. It's now the mezzanine level of the Loring Pasta Bar. During this period, he discovered the music of Woody Guthrie and forged a new identity and began to call himself Bob Dylan. Meanwhile, John Kerner had joined forces with Dave Bray and Tony Glover, and the group was attracting a lot of followers. Early in 1961, Dylan heads off to New York to visit Woody Guthrie, and his next-door neighbor from Gray's Drug, Marv Davidoff, joins a group of Freedom Riders from Dinkytown who went to Mississippi in 1961. They were arrested and sent to the notorious Parchman Farm Prison. They were part of the process that ultimately changed segregation in the South. Meanwhile, Bob Dylan has taken New York by storm. Less than a year after arriving, his first album on Columbia Records is released. The next year, in 1963, three days after his 22nd birthday, his second album, Free Wheelin, comes out. Within a couple of months, he appears at the Newport Folk Festival and the famous March on Washington, where his song, Blowin' in the Wind, becomes one of the anthems of the civil rights movement. Back in Dinkytown, the Kerner Ray and Glover album Blues Rags and Hollers was released to widespread critical acclaim and they found themselves at the center of a blues revival with such fans as David Bowie and George Harrison and John Lennon of the Beatles. Dinkytown's influence was now international. Over the next few years, other cultural institutions like the Minnesota Dance Theater and the Loft Literary Center got their start in Dinkytown. Dinkytown has traditionally been a cultural incubator that has regularly spawned innovation. In a recent letter written in support of historical preservation, former Vice President Walter Mondale reflects on his memories. Quote, I especially want to comment on what Dinkytown has meant to me since those years long ago when I was an undergraduate and during those law school years. Since then, my connections with Dinkytown have only deepened as the years have gone by. I often go there for lunch and have for many years to meet with friends to tell old stories and to reconnect with the university. He concludes, Dinkytown has always been life-size, and I'm very afraid that if we destroy the small-scale buildings themselves, it will erase those memories and meaning, and therefore the history could be seriously impaired. Perhaps we could find more opportunity to protect Dinkytown's remarkable history and culture. I hope we will do so. With deepest appreciation, Walter F. Mondale.